For previous oral microbiome tests, I focused most of the attention on Alzheimer's disease-related bacteria, a few of which are shown here, and they include P. gingivalis, F. nucleatum, and Tanarella forsythia. But it may be more important to first get rid of a different bacterium, which is known as Ceratia marquescens, which I'll refer to as Ceratia for short in this video going forward. Ceratia adversely impacts many human health related outcomes, and that's what we can see here. So just to illustrate a few, it impacts pneumonia, sepsis, meningitis, and you can see that there's a pretty long list. So with that in mind, why wasn't this bacterium mentioned in earlier videos? And that's because for my first oral microbiome test, it looked like a standard profile with no major outliers. And that's what we'll see here. And these are some of the bacteria that were on test number one. So on the left, we've got microbial species. Bristle's test doesn't just include bacteria, so I've included microbial, which includes things like fungi, like candida too. And then on the right, we've got re relative abundance in percent. So percent relative abundance. And we can see that my first test was in June of 2022. Note that these data are generated, as I mentioned, by Bristle. Discount link in the video's description if you want to track your own oral microbiome. So as I mentioned, I've been spending most of my time in these videos on the oral microbiome on these Alzheimer's disease-related bacteria, which are highlighted there in red. And we can see that I have and still have those bacterium in my oral microbiome. And although they're at low levels, I don't want them there at all. And in terms of no crazy outliers, we can see that although I do have relatively high amounts of a Rothia species at about 21% and Streptococcus mitis at about 12%, and there'll be more on that bacterium coming later, uh, there wasn't anything out of the ordinary. And we'll see why that's true in a second. But this was actually test number two, because for test number one, I had very high levels of that Ceratia species. And note, when I said crazy outlier, 88% of all bacteria were just that one bacterium. And that far dwarfs what we can see for that Rothia species at 21%. So that first test was thought to be contaminate, contaminated with this Ceratia species. So Bristol removed it from all following tests. But Ceratia kept appearing in very high amounts in my oral microbiome. And that's what we'll see here. So although it went down a bit for test number three to 41% of all bacteria, and somehow went down to zero for test number four, we can see that for tests five and six, it went even higher to 95% of all bacteria. I mean, only 5% of the, the rest of my oral microbiome being non ceratia marquescens is just outrageous. So is this contamination or a real effect? So I reached out to Bristle to get more insight and they informed me that within their users, 90%, around 90% have absolutely zero of this ceratia species. So if it was a contamination issue, we'd expect that there would be a greater prevalence in their cohort. Seven to nine percent have less than one percent relative abundance. So up to 99 percent have very low levels, less than one percent of Ceratia, this Ceratia species, in their cohort. And then we can clearly see which group I'm in. I'm in that one to three percent that have above one percent. And this isn't, again, above one percent. This is in three of six tests. I have greater than 88 percent abundance. So what can get rid of Ceratia marquescens? So I went to PubMed and did a search and came across a study where in vitro, so this is in cell culture, Ceratia marquescens growth is inhibited by 5% xylitol. And that's what we'll see here. So we've got a control plate that's filled with Ceratia. And then in the presence of 5% xylitol, we can see that all of that red, which is how Ceratia stains, is almost completely gone. And more directly, we can quantify, see that quantified here. So on the y-axis, we've got percent biofilm formation for that Ceratia species. In controls, so you can see 100% in the controls. And then when 5% xylitol was added to the plate, we can see about an 80% reduction for Ceratia marquescens. So with that in mind, I made a homemade mouthwash, different from the mouthwashes in my earlier videos, somewhat different, but at a higher concentration of xylitol, using exactly 5% xylitol as they did in the study to see if it would work in vivo, not just in vitro. So that's five grams of xylitol per 100 mils of water. And it made an actually a bigger stock. I made a 400 mil solution. So 20 grams of xylitol and dissolved it. And then I used this mouthwash three to five times per day at various times throughout the day for one month. So did 5% xylitol reduce levels of this Ceratia species? And I wish I could say that it did, but unfortunately it did not. And that's what we can see here. So for test number seven, which was in July of 2023, using 5% xylitol, as I mentioned many times throughout the day for 30 days, we can see the Ceratia was at my highest level uh, to date at 96% of all bacteria. So only 
are not Serratia, which again is just outrageous. So this sent me back to the drawing board, which in my case is PubMed, for what can potentially reduce Serratia marquescence. So I came across this paper, which is 40 years old, Hydrogen Peroxide Mediated Antagonism Against Serratia Marquescence by Streptococcus mitis. In other words, Streptococcus mitis through hydrogen peroxide generation can inhibit growth of Serratia marquescence. And there weren't any pre-pictures in the paper, but in a screenshot from that paper, just highlighting, we can see that Streptococcus mitis strain number 17-1 antagonized the growth of 24 different test strains of Serratia marquescence. So that seems like very good news. So then I did a search for probiotics for streptococ Streptococcus mit mitis. Maybe I can take it as an oral probiotic, increasing its, increasing its levels, and that should be able to reduce Serratia marquescence. However, Streptococcus mitis isn't commercially available as a probiotic. So the good news is though that this bacterium, Streptococcus mitis, is in my oral microbiome. And I noticed an interesting trend. So during the four tests when Serratia was 88% or higher, note that Streptococcus mitis was very low, less than 0.4% in each of these tests. And if there is an, an, a direct association between these two, based on that paper, it would seem to be true at least in my data, just observationally. In support of that, during those two tests when somehow Serratia was zero, note that my Streptococcus mitis levels were at their highest amounts ever, about 12 and 11%. And for that intermediate test, when Serratia marquescens was 41%, we can see an intermediate level of Streptococcus mitis. So this suggests that maybe if I can increase Streptococcus mitis, I can reduce Serratia marquescens. But then it got me thinking, maybe I just don't need one bacteria. Maybe I can use a team effort. So with that in mind, could increasing other oral bacteria help limit this Serratia species? And if so, how can I increase Serratia, uh, Streptococcus mitis and these others? So to investigate that, I looked at oral bacteria that are inversely associated with Serratia over those seven studies. So bacteria versus bacteria correlation analysis. And just looking at the ones that were the most abundant, so we've got bacterial species on the right, I'm sorry, on the left, and the average abundance of these bacteria on the left. And the reason why that's important is because there were a lot more bacteria that were significantly associated with Serratia, inversely associated, which means relatively higher levels of these other oral bacteria, lower levels of Serratia. But I, I think it makes the most sense to focus on the bacteria, oral bacteria, that are of the highest relative abundance. So if I have a bacterium that's at 0.3%, I'd expect a bacterium that's there at 5% because there's more of it to be better able to get rid of, if it can, Serratia in my oral microbiome. So these are the most abundant bacteria that are significantly inversely correlated with Serratia. And we can see that by using the p-value. So this is only using a p-value less than 0.05. I didn't adjust for multiple comparisons, and I'm sure there are going to be people who are criticizing me for that in the comments. I'm happy to explain why I'm not using that in this case. So uh, if you want more on the FDR story, please leave a comment, and I'd be happy to discuss it. And then we can see the R, the correlation coefficient, for each of these eight bacteria are negative, which means when these bacteria are relatively higher, that's significantly inversely correlated, or there are lower levels of this Serratia marquescens species, as shown there. Each are negatively correlated. So then note at the top of the list with a correlation coefficient of negative 0.99, remember a perfectly linear correlation is a correlation coefficient of negative one in this case, we can see that Serratia is there, but then also those seven other species. And again, each together in a relatively high abundance. So the sum of these bacteria is about 24% of all bacterium. So I want a team effort to try to get rid of this Serratia species, if I can, by, by increasing levels of these bacterium. So how can I do that? What can I do to increase levels of these bacteria? Could diet have a role? So what I did then is I lined up, because I track diet every day, and I do that by a food scale for those who are new, new to the channel. I've done that since 2015. I lined up the previous 30-day dietary average for both macros, micros, and individual foods and that the, then I have an average dietary intake that corresponds to each oral microbiome test. And because I have seven oral microbiome tests, I can investigate correlations for diet with these bacteria. So is there a common dietary pattern that may possibly impact these bacteria, potentially reducing Serratia? So first, let's start with the obvious. Correlations, for, for, uh, or correlations with Serratia marquescens, because that may have the most direct effect. If I can look at correlations for diet, in potentially reducing Serratia. 
So we can see that there were only two foods that had a p-value less than 0.05. And again, the FDR issue comes up again because I'm going to show correlations for eight more bacteria. There are about 100 uh, different variables for each of these uh, assessments. So I'm potentially looking at 900 comparisons without adjusting for multiple comparisons. And again, I'm happy to discuss this in the comments. I think the issue of replication across multiple bac bacteria species is a potentially more powerful approach. But again, I'm happy to discuss this in the comments. So in terms of foods or nutrients that were signif sorry, significantly associated, co uh, sorry, significantly correlated with Ceratium marquesans, we can see that there are only two based on a nominal p-value or a p-value less than 0.05. First up is protein intake. So a relatively higher protein protein intake is significantly correlated with higher Ceratium marquesans in my data. Now, my protein intake range isn't very wide for these seven tests, but it suggests that when I eat at the lower end of that range, 96 grams per day, Ceratia is lower. And when I eat at the higher end of my range, 99 grams, Ceratia is higher. And I know that that may, may not seem like a big range, but to follow the correlations, I'd expect if correlation can impact causation, I would expect this to be true. By following the correlations, lower end of the protein intake, I may be able to impact Ceratia. But again, I don't just think it's going to be one dietary factor. We can see that low-fat yogurt, and I won't go into why it's low-fat yogurt. I, if anyone's interested, please leave a comment. I have a video on low-fat versus high-fat in my data. Please leave a comment. I'd be happy to, to describe that there. So now we can see an inverse, a significant inverse correlation between low-fat yogurt with Ceratia. In other words, when low-fat yogurt is at the high end of my range, which is 150 grams per day, there is lower Ceratia. And when yogurt is at the low end of my, my range, that's significantly correlated with higher Ceratia. So these are easy to follow. But again, I want to see a common dietary pattern if it exists. So I then looked at correlations for each of the eight bacterial species that are significantly inversely correlated with Ceratia. So higher levels of these bacteria, lower levels of Ceratia. And again, that's a correlation. It's not causation. So just to highlight a few, notice mushrooms. So mushrooms are inversely correlated with Streptococcus infantis. That's potentially a bad thing because we want higher levels of that bacterium. And that data suggests that when I eat a higher mushroom intake, that's significantly correlated with lower levels of that bacteria. So with that in mind, I should eat towards the lower end of my mushroom range if that may relieve some suppression on growth, growth of that oral bacterium. But it isn't just that mushrooms show up in correlation with that bacterium. Note that it pops up in many other places. Six of the eight bacteria also have significant inverse correlations for mushrooms. In other words, maybe too much mushrooms, which have positive correlations with my blood biomarkers, may be bad in very high amounts for my oral microbiome. So that's a very easy fix. I can eat towards the lower end of my range for mushrooms. No big deal. All right, what about other foods that have a common dietary pattern? Well, notice again, low-fat yogurt pops up. In this case, with four of the eight bacteria that are inversely associated with Ceratia and in the same direction. So a relatively higher low-fat yogurt intake is significantly correlated with four of those bacteria in my oral microbiome. So again, that's a relatively easy fix, just increasing yogurt intake from 135 to 150 grams per day. So in using that same approach across all nine of these bacterial species, there are some patterns. So besides mushrooms and yogurt, we can see that onions, so when onions are at the high end of my range, that's significantly correlated with higher serratia. So I can cut my onion intake to the low end of my range, which is unfortunate because I like onions. They add taste and flavor. Uh, so the low end of my range is zero. So that'll be the plan for the next test. Also, protein is significantly correlated with three of these eight bacteria in addition to serratia. So I'm going to eat, again, towards 96 grams per day is the goal. And then in terms of replication, I only looked at uh, nutrients that were found in at least two of the nine comparisons. So that's true for cinnamon, pistachio, vitamin E, B2, and beta cryptoxanthin. So I plan on following the correlations there. Just as an example, pistachios are positively correlated with two of these bacteria. So that suggests eating towards the high end of my range. But that too is an easy, easy fix. I can go a little bit higher to test that correlation. So I've increased it to 15 grams per day. My expectation is that by following as many of these correlations as possible for the next test, I may see an improvement for Ceratia. But I should mention, I don't know if it works. If it doesn't work, I'll recalculate the correlations for oral bacteria with Ceratia going forward, and that will be the plan until I can come up with a better plan. All right, that's all for now. If you're interested in more about my attempts to biohack aging, check us out on Patreon. And before you go, we've got a whole bunch of discount links and merch that you may be interested in, including discount links for at-home metabolomics, NAD quantification, epigenetic testing, 
oral microbiome composition as highlighted in this video, green tea, at-home blood testing with CyFox Health, and note that that panel is different from the at-home metabolomics, diet tracking with chronometer, or if you'd like to support the channel, you can do that with the website, Buy Me A Coffee. We've also got merch, so if you're interested in wearing the Conquer Aging or Diet Trying brand, that link and all the other links will be in the video's description. That's all for now. Thanks for watching. Have a great day.